So, <laughs> our, our ability to survive is really fundamentally knowing what does and does not belong in us. So, when we talk about immunity, which is, again is freedom from sickness, it doesn't mean you're not exposed, right? You're always going to be exposed. In fact, exposures probably assist your ability to have a good immune response. But, but again, active versus passive immunity. So active implies you're doing something. Passive means something is being done for you. And this something has to do with the B and T cells being uh, active in you, right? Um, often we refer to it as antibodies, but really here we'll talk about making your antibodies or not making antibodies in active and passive. Um, but it, we, you know, we could include the T cells if we so desired. Um, and then the other thing we look at here is the, how we're exposed to this. So we also talk about you know, artificial and natural exposures. So do we make our own antibodies? If we do, it's active. Does another organism transfer antibodies to us? That's passive, all right? And I say whether naturally or artificially introduced, you do the work in active. If it is a natural route, you probably get sick. So natural, naturally acquired active immunity is when you come encounter with the pathogen and get sick from it. If it's an artificial, you don't. So artificial is really vaccinations, right? Because you're given a piece of the antigen. It's the route is not natural, but you still do the work to produce the response. Passive, you're transferred antibodies. And I say we're nat whether natural or artificially, you do not work. Natural is mother to fetus, and that's about the only example we really talk about. And then a newborn um, through mom's breast milk. Artificial is used when you do not have time uh, to actually react and will probably die. And so this is things like what, or somebody will die, what Rogam is and what an anti-venom or an anti-serum would be if you've been exposed to something terribly toxic or, or lethal. All right, so again, if we look at our immune response against pathogens, the primary infection when the race is on, right, so time, months, years. Pathogen versus the immune response. Bypasses the barrier defense, so this is applied. And in first days, in the first few days, innate defense will control but not stop the pathogen growth. That's, again, why you get sick, all right? But the adaptive will develop and strengthen enough to clear the invader. So that's what we're looking at here, concentration in blood of the virus itself and the concentration of your T cells. So inversely related, right? As the virus goes up, T cells immediately might decline, but will stabilize and be very high. All right, and this will be why this stays low. All right, until you know if, if your T cell counts decline, the virus will in, will increase again. So a very clear relationship on this. But this is important for us to understand. This is why you have to have a specific immune response because the innate defense and barriers are not going to be very effective really at the end of the day. So here again is our mucosal response, looking again back at, you know, applying all the things we've learned in this chapter. That's what this part is for. Major barriers ready for fight. The um, immunoglobulin A binds pathogens and neutralizes, right? So here we coat with an antibody, cannot bind a, a cell receptor. So here's ways that we're going to function, all right? So Mucous membranes shown here. Again, here's our antibody. M cells bind antigens, especially in food, to assess pathogens. So here are these M cells, part of your digestive tract. Bacteria and fungi, you get a variety of responses. Responses, excuse me, parasites. Uh, mucous responses, immunoglobulin E, eosinophils. Sorry, left the P off here. Viruses, natural killer cells, interferons. T, cytotoxic T cells, antibodies, sorry, God, misspelling, sorry, are ineffective once they enter the cells. I say, so these are the mediators, and I'm caveating that antibodies are ineffective once they enter the cells. So, again, your mucosal response is that you've got these antibodies and other cells ready to go. So here, right below the surface, are T cells and B cells and presenting cells. So this is how where we, we 
zoom in to look at this. And all this slide is telling you is that when we're defending ourselves from these groups of pathogens, there are different components of our immune response that are better suited. And this again is showing that plasma cell secreting antibodies out here into fluids. So this part of the lecture is about applying responses. I remind you that the pathogens that we expose ourselves have gone through the process of evolution and therefore they have antigens that really are more or less structured to evade your immune system. So in other words, the bottom line is that everything is programmed to survive. And if that survival means that you aren't found, great. And that's what we're talking about here. These pathogens do not want to be found. Because if they're found, then they're killed, destroyed and killed. But if they're not found, well, then they can populate and produce more of themselves as they're programmed to do and eat the food around them, right? And live. So I say that all these mechanisms that we've talked about here develop in a more or less an arms race. They are programmed to survive. Selection occurs due to your environment. So we have multiple strains, which differ in surface antigens. Whoops, sorry. Looking at their advantage. Mutation, which then DNA is changed as it's copied from one cell to the next. Genetic recombination. So gene pieces from two different pathogens can be combined so that they, you, they can't be found. And also these pathogens produce immunosuppressive molecules. So these are all ways that, again, pathogens can avoid being detected by you. All right. So something else to consider is that we do respond. So again, this, these are the complexities. So here's our reality for how we want to do things. Here's what makes it hard to defend ourselves. And then we talk about, you know, ways that we don't defend ourselves appropriately. And that's an allergy, response to non-threatening antigen. We call that hypersensitivity, and that is an allergy. We divide it into th four basic types. And um, we look at how they differ, but the bottom line I ask for students is how, is for them to know is how quickly the response develops and who is responsible for the response. So here in type one, this is the immediate reaction, and this is due to really B cells producing this special class of immunoglobulin, which attaches to basophils and mast cells. All right, so that makes the mast cells and basophils, basophil cells, right, good at recognizing this antigen that we now call an allergen. And the allergen, here's the problem. This was not associated with some right, organism that would enter into you and divide and divide and produce more and make you sick. It was just a chemical that entered the body, right? Animal dander, mold, mildews, things like that. And the body mistook it. And here specifically the B cells. All right. Now type two and three involve immunoglobulin G and sometimes M. So different classes of antibodies and they will take longer for the exposure. And this walks you through the type two and three and they're very similar really when it comes down to it. Um, we were looking at um, this response in the, uh, the red blood cells, right, in a mismatch for type 2. Type 4 is going to take the longest, and these are the most problematic, really, because it's been a couple days since you got exposed to this allergen, um, which is a specialized type of antigen, and you may not recall what it is you actually encountered. So this, unlike the others, involves the T cells, and it's usually a dermal exposure, so contact dermatitis, and it generally takes a couple days for it to develop. This is classic poison ivy, right? Poison sumac and all those and cosmetics, heavy metals. That's what this is. All right, autoimmunity. So another problem with our immune response. So we for, we we just don't know self from non-self. So this again, and it can be failure in the maturation, but really we probably killed those cells. So what happened? to allow us to, these T and B cells, to forget or mistake self and non-self, all right? And again, I say here for the B cells, they produce autoantibodies and cytotoxic T cells attack the body's tissues and organs, okay? Why would this happen, all right? Well, we've got a couple things, and this you should know for the test. A virus could come along and incorporate a protein from the host cell surface. Yeah, your own proteins, that, they can take those up. And now they display this on their surface, so they, you know, which, who, who are we attacking? 
So if a T cell becomes activated against this virus, it may start seeing the self protein as the problem. T cell programming fails, as I mentioned above. This can happen, and it can happen more with age as the thymus declines. And so that's why we see an increase in autoimmunity as we age. Um, it could be, right, could be antibodies um, that cross-react with the self-antigen. Um, and this happens in some bacteria. Again, as, we're, as we, we didn't need that MHC, but as those B cells are binding to the antigen, they may be binding to a nearby, um, they might be binding to a molecule that is similar, the antigen on that bacteria, Streptococcus A, is very similar to antigens on our own cells. And this is especially true in heart cells, valvular cells. That's why you often see valve problems with rheumatic fever. And then the fourth group, again, so again, you've recognized a, an antigen, a self-antigen um, on your cells looks like the antigen on this invading cell. So there, it's hard to tell the difference. And then we've got that sometimes fetal cells, which of course have different antigens in moms, which cross into mom circulation, but are generally destroyed fairly quickly during development, um, can actually hang around. That's what we mean by persist. So they can they end up um, staying someplace. So not necessarily in circulation. Um, oftentimes we see it in the skin. So they come out of circulation. They remain in some area of the body and live. And then later on, um, they are detected. And because we are detecting them among our own cells, we have an autoimmune response because it's hard to tell the fetal cells from our cells. And again, there's similarities between these cells which uh, complicate this. Transplantation and tissue rejection, um, these are the results of a functioning immune system, right? And this basically comes down to the fact that the donor's tissues are recognized as foreign. And then we have tissue rejection reaction. And this is mostly done by T cells, so it looks very much, tissue rejection reaction looks like a T, cytotoxic T response. And it's pretty lethal. And so we try to reduce this by matching, right, these uh, six surface self antigens from MHC1 and MHC2. We administer immunosuppressive drugs before transplant. Um, to try to keep T cells from becoming activated. But I say here that there's a trade-off that these can, dam can cause other problems in the recipient. All right? And that finally gets us through the lymph system. There's a lot here, and if there's anything that you're just stumbling over, and, and I really think there should be or will be, and I might not have done a good job presenting it in these videos, please come talk to me.